So good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the um, afternoon sessions uh, of this uh, conference, the Monetary Policy Conference. There will be also a, a keynote speech later uh, in, the, in the afternoon. But I'm very happy to be chairing this one because uh, there are two papers that are very, um, first very relevant, very timely, full of uh, fresh insights into uh, something that keeps central bank busy these days. Uh, so they, they have one common theme is liquidity, how much banks need in terms of liquidity, uh, how much a central bank should supply, uh, how much is too much, how little is too little is a very relevant question for at least two reasons uh, or two processes that central bank are now busy you know, on. One is the reduction of uh, balance sheets. You know, so. Uh, how far central banks should go in that process and uh, at what pace. So relevant uh, questions asked there and also good, uh, good answers that can inform that process. But the other one is also the uh, long-term vision on uh, an operating system no? for a steady state operating system. So the set of procedures by which central banks uh, implement policy. And there again, you can do it with more or less liquidity. So again, very, very nicely uh, done papers that uh, give you a structured way to think through these, uh, these issues. Now, I'll give, you, I'll give the floor first to um, Vera Lacharia, NYU, um, Stern's uh, School of Business, uh, on a paper that you wrote with uh, Raghu Rajan and other um, uh, co-authors. And I understand it's a new version of the paper of the Jackson Hole paper. So I see very much already quoted and uh, yeah, uh, referenced. Uh, uh, so you have 35 minutes, then uh, I'll give the floor to Lorenzo Burlon, who is uh, your, your discussion for another 15 minutes and then 10 minutes of discussion. Then we'll come to the second paper, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later. No, uh, David, uh, welcome David, by the way. Uh, and uh, Annette uh, uh, Wissing Jorgensen brought this paper, a very, very nice one. Um, uh, David is Senior Associate Director in the Division of Monetary Affairs of the Fed Board. And uh, your discussion is here, is Cyril uh, Cuellier uh, of the ECB. So you, you see, we put ECB people as discussants so that uh, we can vet your paper in depth and, uh, no. Uh, extract the, the most of, uh, out of them. So, Virat, please. Thank your, you. Your thank you so much, uh, Massimo, and thank you to organizers for having me here. Uh, let me just check that this is working. Okay. So, uh, this joint work with Rahul Chauhan, uh, Raghuram Rajan, and Sasha Stefan. Uh, and as Massimo mentioned, this is an extension of the work we did at Jackson Hole. Uh, which was presented last August. I think there was a fair bit of skepticism, maybe for the right reasons, that there was a sense that banks are fine and that we were sort of barking up the wrong tree. We should have focused on non-banks. So maybe we have to thank Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, et cetera, for making the paper a little more relevant. Okay, so um, uh, what we're trying to understand is why is it that even though we have injected such huge quantities of reserves uh, into the financial system, uh, it seems that we are still talking about injecting more. Uh, you know, we seem to be on and off getting hit by financial conditions that seem surprisingly fragile. Uh, maybe the bank failures were the most extreme of the lot, but if you think about what led to the repo rate spike in September 19 in the US. It wasn't a very big deal. There was some money that flew as advanced tax flows into the government account. Some Japanese banks were closed, so their reserves weren't available in the system. But there was still more than a trillion dollars of reserves in the system at that point. And yet, you know, there was like a shortage of liquidity in the interbank market this time in the repo markets. Uh, then, of course, we had the pandemic when there was a huge dash for cash on bank credit lines. Uh, and, you know, shadow banking markets froze and that stress partly got passed on to banks. 
Uh, we had turmoil in the UK guilds where pension funds were struggling for liquidity, uh, even though their positions were fundamentally hedged. Uh, and then we had the bank failures maybe to top it off all. Okay, so <clears throat> we, uh, we are starting off with the premise, uh, it's just meant to be a rhetorical question that, that maybe this financial fragility is linked to the fact that central banks have expanded their balance sheets a lot. And before they complete their contraction or waning of the balance sheet, uh, shocks come and hit. Uh, and you know, what is, it, what is it in this combination of the expansion and then the planned contraction and then interim shocks arriving uh, that leads to financial fragility? We are trying to make sense of all this. And uh, our starting point is uh, our theory paper. Uh, Raghu and I did a theory paper in 2021, where we were basically saying that, you know, when central banks embarked on QE, they approached it very much from an asset pricing perspective, which is maybe there are some balance sheets or assets whose prices are dislocated. Why don't we go and have a meaningful impact on these asset prices? Maybe that will change the portfolios of banks and financial intermediaries, maybe create some good search for yield, and we'll get the economy up and about again, uh, having hit the zero lower bound on the interest rates or effective lower bound. Uh, our, our main insight in the theory paper was that maybe this is a very limited way of looking at central bank balance sheet expansion, because it just focuses on the asset side of the financial system but doesn't really say anything about how QE and then quantitative tightening are altering the liability side of the financial system. Because if we want to think about financial stability, ultimately we have to think about the demandable claims on the financial system. Okay. So uh, the key insight that I'll first try and establish, which was an assumption in our theory paper, is that reserves on the balance sheets of commercial banks who typically hold the reserves are financed with demandable and typically uninsured demandable deposits. And, and that is actually our main point, even though maybe at central banks there's a broad acceptance of this point that quantitative easing is not just an expansion of the central bank balance sheet, it's also an expansion of commercial bank balance sheets as I'll try and explain. Okay, so if you think about a traditional banking system in which all assets are held by banks, so, so banks on their capital structure, let's say, have some securities and they have their checking account at the central bank, I'm just calling it the Fed here, and there are some reserves sitting in there and they have some liability structure of deposits and capital. Okay, so when the central bank does QE, it's purchasing a security in a world in which all treasuries which are not held by the Fed are held by banks, this must happen as an asset swap with banks. And so the mechanical operation of QE is to transfer a security from the balance sheet of the banking system to the balance sheet of the central bank. The central bank credits the checking account of the bank with a reserve, and at least the mechanical operation of QE doesn't need to expand the balance sheet of the banking system. Okay, now it could still be the case that having shortened the duration of its assets, banks go and then shorten the duration of their liabilities, but at least that's not happening mechanically as a result of quantitative easing. Okay? It turns out that in practice, in modern day financial system, when treasuries are held not just by banks, but they are held by non-banks as well, such as insurance companies, pension funds, family offices, high net worth individuals, mutual funds, hedge funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that QE doesn't exactly work like this. It instead looks like an asset swap with the public or the non-banks. Okay, which is that. So now there's some non-banks in the system. They hold some treasury securities and some cash, which I'm going to call as deposits. Uh, in the banking system, and it's banks that I'm assuming who are the ultimate holders of reserves uh, in their checking account with the central bank. Okay? So now when the central bank does QE in the modern financial system, it's the non-banks who also want to participate, 
maybe because there is a price impact and they want to benefit from it, or maybe the yield curve becomes too flat and they don't want to hold on to the securities. We are not going to model these motives. But they tender their securities via the banking system as the prime brokers uh, to the Fed. The Fed, of course, credits the bank with the reserves. But because the ultimate tendering of securities is from non-banks, non-banks now have an extra deposit into the banking system. Okay? And because these are relatively large transactions, because these are transactions with institutions, typically in the first round, these deposits are going to be uninsured demandable deposits. Okay? Now, these non-banks may turn around and search for yield. They might say, why should I sit on so much of deposits? Why don't I convert my deposit into a long-term bond that a corporation is issuing? But you know, you have to now think through the second round, what is the corporation going to do with the bond issuance? They will distribute some salaries or make investment payments. Ultimately, some uninsured deposits are going to come back into the banking system through that operation one way or the other. Okay? Now, the key question then is, if you did expand the commercial bank balance sheets in this way and with uninsured demandable deposits, when you do the contraction, is it going to be benign? Or somehow, because you've expanded the stock of uninsured demandable deposits, maybe reserves are not going to move around very smoothly in the system. Do you, are you taking on some financial fragility risks? Okay. And in case the financial fragility manifests before the central bank has completed its operations, and I've always been puzzled by this forward guidance of exit policies because, you know, shocks are not going to respect the timetable of the central bank. At least that was my experience when I was at the Reserve Bank of India that I can have whatever timetable I want for my open market operations. The fiscal policy, dollar interest rates, exchange rate shocks to India, they didn't actually respect my open market operations timetable. They arrived at their own pace at their own whims and fancies, and then we had to deal with all these shocks. And so the problem then is that if these financial fragility shocks occur before the four or five year of waning cycle that the central bank has decided for itself, it's not going to do the waning in the first place. Because once the fragility shock occurs, there'll be a ratcheting up in demand for liquidity, the central bank will inject more, and what was one trillion will become four trillion, and then it'll become eight trillion, and they're just sort of expanding the liquidity dependence of the system overall. Okay, so the sorts of questions that we try and answer empirically are, how does QE work? Is it really working with non-banks as I showed you? Uh, demandable deposits are of course getting created through mechanical operation of QE, but once banks are flush with reserves, typically earning low interest rate in times of QE, do they then try to seek to sell these reserves and create more demandable claims such as credit lines in order to earn some extra fees on these reserves that they have? So uninsured demandable deposits, credit lines which are also demandable from corporations or from individuals if they are credit cards. Uh, what happens to these claims when the central bank undertakes quantitative tightening? Do these claims shrink at the same pace? as the central bank unwinds. So is QT literally an unwinding of the liability side of the banking system as well in terms of shrinking the demandable claims back to their original levels? Or is it that you shrink the reserves, but the demandable claims still remain in the system so that then you could have some shocks? So that would be a time series problem. That could be a cross-section problem, which is that maybe once you inject the reserves and demandable deposits that created, depending upon different banks' incentives, some banks now use their reserves to originate more assets and end up with more, less reserves and more liabilities, but some other banks end up with more reserves and less liabilities, then the interbank market has to function very well when shocks arise, but it may not function if there are hoarding and other kinds of incentives. Okay? So there could be financial stability implications if the time series of claims and the cross-section of claims doesn't necessarily work out the way QT could happen in, in a smooth manner in the markets. Okay.
So uh, in interest of time, let me just quickly mention the results and then start showing you a few things, uh, which is that we're going to find that in time series, there is some hysteresis, okay, which is that uh, QE happens with non-banks, but when quantitative tightening is undertaken, it doesn't fully reverse the operations. Okay, So what I would ideally like to do is that if central bank purchase securities from an insurance company, so that that company's deposit with the bank gets extinguished when quantitative tightening is done, I want to do exactly the reverse of whoever tendered the securities to me. Okay, because then I can be sure that they took out their deposit from the banking system somewhere and used it to purchase the securities back from the Fed. Okay? But there is, these transactions are open market transactions. They're, they are not designed as asset swaps with the same counterparty. And so there's some hysteresis, which is that the demandable deposits remain with the banking system. And that's because quantitative tightening looks like the first operation, which was an asset swap with banks. Okay? So what we find is that in QE, it is non-banks that tender to the Fed. But in quantitative tightening, it is banks that purchase the securities from the Fed. And the demandable deposits that got created in the system uh, in, in some Q, uh, quantitative tightening episodes remain in the system. And then there is a search for yield in the cross-section, which is that relatively low capital banks in the period we are looking at smaller banks, uh, they did actually seek out illiquidity. So they were willing to give up their reserves and expand the stock of demandable liabilities even more. And that kind of created fragility in the cross-section uh, of the banks. Okay. But our main concern is that we have thought about balance sheet expansion a bit too glibly, which is, okay, the situation is at ELB or zero lower bound. I have to expand my balance sheet. Of course, I can just seamlessly unwind it in four or five years whenever I'm done. I think there's no evidence that any central bank is successful in doing this without arrival of interim shocks and then having to inject even more liquidity in the system, which is the, which is the phenomenon we are calling as liquidity dependence, that we, are just, we just seem to be ratcheting up the liquidity provision uh, in the system. Okay, so let's look at some data. So th this is basically various episodes for the United States, the QE1 to 3. This is the passive phase of the Fed when it's just not reinvesting the reserves that it gets from the government on the securities it has, it has purchased back into the system. Then there's active QT in which Fed is selling securities in the market uh, from after the repo market spike, I'm going to call it pandemic QE, even though the pandemic part of the QE starts two quarters later. And then there is the quantitative tightening too. Uh, and of course, both the QT episodes are also associated with rate hikes in QT2 with a f much greater pace of rate hikes. Okay, so these are reserves with the commercial banking system. This is not the total size of the Fed system, which would include government account balances, cash, etc. So these are just the reserve balances of the commercial banks. So every time QE is done, reserves expand. The actual QE stops before each of these lines. So there's some reduction relative to GDP in the reserves. Uh, and then in the passive and the active QT phase, you can see that the reserves relative to GDP are coming down. Then a massive injection of reserves occurs at the time of the pandemic, uh, both due to fiscal and QE uh, part of the Fed. Then QE continues in the background, even though fiscal sort of stops. And then you have the reserve shrinking again during QT2. So first, what did the, uh, uh, what did the deposits of the banking system look like? Uh, over this period, during the QE and the post-QE phase, the uh, deposits of the banking system kept growing. Uh, from being at about 50% uh, of GDP to about 60%, so about 10% GDP increase. And then you can see that in QT1, which was the first significant quantitative tightening, the deposits are very, very stable and practically flat. Okay? So even though the first part, the QE part, looks like an asset swap with non-banks, this part looks very much like an asset swap with banks because 
bank balance sheet size is not changing d during QT much. Okay. Uh, here you can see very strikingly the expansion of demandable deposits, as I'll show you later. It's not just deposits, it's actually demandable deposits with the pandemic arrival. Uh, and then unlike QT1, QT2, because perhaps of the size of the rate hikes, the overnight RRP mechanism, and then the bank runs, uh, the deposits are actually leaving parts of the banking system and finding their way into non-bank parts of the banking system. Interestingly, banks are also selling credit lines during QE. Once again, they are very, very stable. So even though reserves are coming down, the two demandable claims which are in the green line are at almost the same percentage of GDP. Okay? And so you can see that in some sense, QT is automatically worsening the liquidity position of the banking system because demandable claims as percent of GDP are remaining flat, but the reserves with the banking system are coming down. Uh, and then if you break these up, uh, at the top I have the two uh, demandable deposits. So the thick black line is uninsured demandable. The dashed line is insured demandable. Uh, time deposits are practically irrelevant over this period because of the relatively low rates. And you can see here that both in the initial phase, both insured and uninsured are rising. Uh, at the time of the pandemic and the fiscal stimulus, again, both insured and uninsured are rising. However, as QE continues during the pandemic, it's only the uninsured deposit component that keeps rising and then eventually uh, comes down. Okay. So the question is, uh, can one put some empirical structure on all of this descriptive uh, simple graphs that are out there? So first, I'm just going to show you what happens in the aggregate, that just taking the figures and building some estimates around the elasticities of these quantities to reserves, and then following the work of David and Annette uh, wissing Jorgensen, I want to show you a little bit on what that's also doing to price of liquidity in the system. Okay, then to build a little bit of causality, uh, I have to go to the cross-section of banks to understand behavior. But then the problem is, in the cross-section, reserves are not exogenous uh, to a bank. They are exogenous to the banking system, but what reserves each bank holds is, of course, its private endogenous decision. So I have to, we have to deal with the endogeneity of reserves a little bit. Okay, and then finally, if there is time, I'll talk a little bit about what, what does this mean for the buildup of fragility that might have led to March 20 and March 23, COVID and then SVB kind of episodes. Okay, so first aggregate evidence, very simple regressions of just quantities of deposits or credit lines, uh, uh, either as arithmetic changes or in preferred specification log changes to deal with stationarity, just trying to explain them in terms of the changes in the aggregate reserves of the banking system with some lags to control for seasonality, but not very crucial. Okay? So if you do this, what you see is that deposits have an elasticity of about 0.14 to 0.18 on the reserves in the banking system. Okay? So when reserves expand, deposits, and especially demand deposits expand, so demand deposits elasticity is slightly greater than that of overall deposits. And you can see why, because time deposits actually have a, have a reverse relationship. Time deposits shrink when the aggregate quantity of reserves expands. One reason could be that reserves are very short-lived asset, and so banks actually then don't want to have a short, have a long-term liability when a big chunk of the assets have been converted into short-term reserves. And you can see that banks expand their credit lines as well at a much lower elasticity, but that elasticity is partly building up over time, as you can see in the lag term. Now, because the logs are a bit hard to interpret because it's an elasticity, so you have to convert percentage changes into absolute quantities, even though the arithmetic change regressions violate some stationarity principles, I'm just going to run them just to understand the magnitudes. And what you see here is that deposits change basically one for one with an expansion of reserves in the banking system. In fact, demandable deposits expand more than one for one. Uh, 
which is not what you would expect through a mechanical effect of QE. So there's some second round effects going on. And you can see here that that's because time deposits are actually shrinking. And so some of that is showing up in the growth of demand deposits. And credit lines uh, are expanding by about 15% for, uh, for a dollar injection of these reserves. Now, you can break up the demand deposits into uninsured and insured deposits. So these are the overall uninsured and insured. And then the demandable deposits are then broken up into uninsured and insured. Once again, 1 to 4 is in log changes. 5 to 8 is in arithmetic changes. And what you see is that bulk of the effect is actually coming through uninsured deposits. So reserves are associated with an expansion of uninsured deposits. And uninsured demandable deposits have much greater elasticity than insured demandable deposits. Uh, and once again, if you go to the overall quantities, uh, you see a similar pattern in data. Okay. So that's the impact of reserves on the quantity of demandable claims. Now, the question is, one, one way of thinking about the liquidity stabilizing role of reserves is that if I inject a lot of reserves in the system, it should reduce the rate at which banks are willing to exchange reserves with each other. Because I'm creating a surplus reserve system, banks should really be willing to transfer reserves to each other at very, very low cost, because no one really needs such a huge quantity of reserves. Now, you can immediately see that the fact that you inject the system with reserves, you think you are creating surplus liquidity, is already assuming that reserves are not altering the liability structure of the banking system. Okay, because if you are injecting $1 of reserve and you are creating $1 of liability, it's not at all clear that you've actually created surplus liquidity in the system because you have a claim of the same magnitude that's runnable on those reserves. Okay? So uh, what David and Anet did is this interesting regression in which they looked at the Fed funds rate relative to the interest on reserves as the price of liquidity in the system. A stabilizing role of reserves would imply that this coefficient alpha should be negative. And then they also looked at the role of deposits over here. In our view of the world, in our theory work with Raghu, as well as the empirical work, deposits, especially demandable deposits, are like an encumbrance or on the reserves, which is, you know, they are also a claim on reserves. So just because I expanded reserves, if deposits expand, this, the liquidity stabilizing role of reserves should be compromised uh, because you know, uh, you're just not creating free liquidity in the system. And then we add a little bit of credit line related measures as well. Once again, because these are large aggregate quantities, if you prefer, you can run these specification in log changes to deal with stationarity a little bit better. Okay, in any case, what do you find is that this is the main result of David. I don't want to steal his thunder, but that, you know, this is, this relationship is very flat. Uh, but once you adjust for deposits, and in our case also credit lines, then you recover this negative relationship, okay, which is that in order to understand the impact of reserves on effective Fed funds rate, you have to recognize whether deposits are getting created in the system. Okay? And you can verify this in a table, but in interest of time, I'll skip that. Okay? Now, what I want to do next, though, is to see how the slope of this line, which is on reserves, and then there's also, when you run the regressions, there's also a slope on demandable deposits. So let me just spend time on one spec here, maybe, maybe say, table 8. Uh, column eight, in which reserves have a negative slope, but the, and that's controlling for uninsured demandable deposits that have a positive slope of 0.19, okay? So this says that if I create $1 of reserves, but that's associated with the creation of $1 of uninsured demandable deposits, it's not at all clear that I'm having any stabilizing impact on the Fed funds rate at all, because the two effects are going to offset each other, okay? Now you can, Estimate these coefficients over time in different periods, in quantitative easing times, in quantitative tightening times, and so on. Okay? And why are we doing that? Because, I, because we, we, are, we are trying to question this basic view that central banks have had that if we create a surplus reserve system by QE, we are actually reducing the price of liquidity in the system. Maybe in, in normal times when the demandable claims are not coming due, there are no fragility shocks. Maybe you get this effect. 
But maybe when shocks arise, uh, you could get the opposite effect of the supply of reserves. Okay? So the traditional intuition is that supply of reserves will push down the price of liquidity. Uh, our intuition is that no, because there'll be new liquidity claims that have now come up, uninsured demandable deposits, credit lines, and this endogenous demand for liquidity when certain shocks arise like QT or fiscal shocks, etc., can now push the price of liquidity in the other direction. Okay? So it's not at all clear how the net effect may play out. Okay? So what we did is we just estimated these uh, coefficients on reserves and uninsured demandable deposits. Left hand side is once again effective Fed funds rate minus the interest on reserves. And we just plotted it basically quarter by quarter okay, using lag data. These are rolling coefficients. And what you find here is that especially during active QT periods, the price of reserves after controlling for uninsured demandable deposits becomes more negative. Okay? So an extra dollar of reserves in this time is going to have a very big stabilizing impact on the Fed funds rate. Now, some people look at this and say the recipe is to inject more reserves into the system. Okay? But what they're not realizing is that simultaneously, the coefficient on demandable deposits is going up as well. So if you have more demandable deposits in the system, that's a bigger claim to liquidity, that's going to have an opposite impact on Fed funds rate and cause the rate to rise. So if I see these coefficients and, and, and interpret this as scarcity of reserves, if I do QE and inject more reserves, and if that creates more uninsured demandable deposits, I will not get much of an impact because I'm actually completely unwinding the effect through deposit creation uh, in the system. Okay. In any case, what's, what's interesting here is that the, the coefficient on reserves becomes more negative during QT. The coefficient on demand deposits becomes more uh, positive during QT, essentially saying that liquidity stress is, is a feature of this quantitative uh, tightening episode. Okay. So then we go to our panel tests. Uh, as I said, what do we have to do in the panel? We can't treat reserves as exogenous for a bank, so we need to do some instrumentation. The simplest instrument you can think of is that the central bank controls the aggregate supply of reserves. No individual bank does. So if because of my position as a primary dealer or my relationship with non-banks, Whenever central bank injects reserves, if I can get an estimate of my reserves beta, which is that if central bank injects a dollar of reserve, what fraction of that reserve comes to me as JP Morgan? What fraction of the reserve comes to me as Silicon Valley Bank? That's my reserve beta. Then I will know how much is an exogenous shock to my reserves when central bank injects liquidity. Okay, because given my positioning as a prime broker, maybe I get a certain fraction of the reserves whenever the central bank injects that, the, the, those reserves. Okay? So we do two, two, two shocks. We look at overall shock to the bank, commercial banking reserves. We also look at overall change in the balance sheet of the Fed as a whole. The first instrument suffices by itself. And then we look at what has been the past four quarter share of a bank in these aggregate reserves that are getting injected. Okay? So think of this as the share of each bank in the past, uh, in the recent quarters, and then this is a shock to the aggregate reserves. Okay? And that's going to be our, our reserves instrument. We verify that it sort of statistically works in the first stage. Note that by construction, these reserves instruments add up to one across the entire banking system because someone or the other has to get the reserves uh, when the central bank injects them. Okay, so now we can do the uh, impact of this exogenous component of reserves on the uninsured demand deposits in the cross section. And what do we find? We, we get that during quantitative easing, there is a coefficient of about 11 to 12%. So that's similar to the elasticities we had seen in the log differences earlier. And this effect is driven actually by below median equity capitalization banks. Okay? So banks which are seeing greater growth in their, de in their demandable deposits with central banks injection of reserves tend to be the low capitalized banks. And we interpret that generally as a search for yield by these banks. 
In contrast, if you look at quantitative tightening periods, which is post QE and then 14 to 19, we pretty much don't have any impact. It's statistically insignificant, and if anything, it's negative sign, but I'm just interpreting this coefficient as zero. And so it says that when reserves expand, uninsured demandable deposits expand during QE, but there's no similar contraction during QT, at least not during the first QT. Okay, now two quick things. First, uh, is this active? Uh, is this just deposit creation or are banks then also actively trying to reduce the duration of their liabilities given that QE has shortened the duration, uh, created a huge short duration asset on their portfolio? So what we find is that especially the uh, banks that have market power and can alter the maturity of their deposits, they seem to shrink the term structure or term spreads on their deposits so that they can get more demandable deposits into their balance sheet. So they are matching low duration reserves with low duration uh, liabilities. Okay? And they're also selling more credit lines during quantitative easing, uh, especially to non-investment grade firms. Okay? I'm not going through the magnitudes of all of these effects. Okay, so then what happens is now we have to understand the fragility consequences. I may not be able to show you all the COVID and the SVB parts, but I just want to show you the ratcheting up that gets built up along the way, okay? So why is it, like, where do I see that during, as you transition from QE to QT, these risks are actually materializing? So why is it that banks are not shrinking their liquidity? Uh, who does not shrink liquidity, and what are the consequences? Where does it show up in the liquidity risk uh, in the balance sheets of banks? Okay. okay, so first things first, if you just look at the growth of uninsured demandable deposits relative to assets in the US banking system, I've divided banks by above 250 billion assets in the previous quarter, 50 to 250 billion and below 50 billion. These are the cutoffs by which the strongest liquidity coverage ratio is applied, the moderate version is applied, and no liquidity coverage ratio is applied. Okay? And you can see here that broadly there is an overall ratcheting up of uninsured demandable deposits. It's the strongest for the smallest banks in a proportional sense. Uh, but of course, in terms of quantities, it's the large banks that's going to dominate this. Okay. So that was relative to assets. Now I can look at these uninsured demandable deposits relative to reserves. And what you see is that during QE, both uninsured demandable deposits and credit lines come down. But during quantitative tightening, this fragility ratios start rising up again. Again, during QE, they come down. And during QT, they start rising again. Okay. okay. Uh, so now... The question is, why, why is it that banks are not shrinking their deposits? So one possibility, as I discussed, is that maybe because during QT, they are doing the asset swap. So they are saying, okay, I have these deposits. I'll give you reserves to the central bank and let me get the securities back because that way I can always tender them back to the Fed in a lender of last resort and get the reserves back if I want. So now, even if you recognize that eligible assets that a bank owns are a store of liquidity, so now I can look at uninsured demandable deposits and look at them at, as reserves plus eligible assets. Okay, and now, I'm, and now what you see is that relative to eligible assets, the largest banks have actually been reducing their liquidity risk, but the smallest banks, which are below 50 billion, they've rammed up their liquidity risk from under one to almost the same as the other categories of banks, okay? And so one of our conclusions is that the, it's perhaps not surprising that these relatively small banks are the ones that are bleeding quite badly because they are the ones whose uh, liquidity risk has ratcheted up quite, quite significantly. Last point, and then I'll stop. I'm just showing you the buildup of fragility. We have seen that SVB and COVID shocks didn't play out very well. So now you can expand liquidity risk to not just include uninsured demandable deposits, but also include credit lines. So these are demandable claims and scale them by reserves plus eligible assets. I'm looking at QE to the passive phase after QE and then the active QT. 
And what you see is that in the cross section, the distribution of liquidity risk is becoming very, very skewed. Okay? So you are shifting from relatively low liquidity risk in the system to many banks actually having liquidity ratios which are very, very high uh, at this end. Okay. So in interest of time, I'll let you read the paper on the stress parts. But I think our, our main policy uh, implication, if I can just take half a minute more, is that QE is not just a central bank expansion, it is an expansion of the commercial banking system. I think that's our main message. And it's an expansion with uninsured demandable deposits. And therefore, when you start doing quantitative tightening, accidents are waiting to happen because you are actually taking away a big part of liquidity that you've injected and which is now has a lot of demandable claims on the other side. So should you engage in QT very carefully? Should you revisit the scope of QE, worrying about the financial stability consequences and the possibility that it may be almost impossible for the central bank to exit? Maybe it's a Hotel California kind of a mechanism. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, well, while the slides are going up, uh, thanks uh, for the organizer for having me to discuss this uh, great paper. Um, I mean, uh, the usual disclaimer applies, obviously. Um, so, uh, let's see if we see them. Yeah, very good. So, I mean, um, this, like many other papers of, of, uh, of Viral, is, uh, is, is like a stone thrown in a pond. I mean, we are here one year after uh, the momentous appearance in the Jackson Hole, and we are still floating on the ripples created by, by, by this paper, I would say. And the, the claim of this paper is quite clear. I mean, it's that, that expansions and shrinkage of central bank balance sheets has financial uh, stability ramifications for small, weak, and unsu tendentially unsupervised banks. And you can see it in this uh, chart that uh, luckily uh, Vidal has decided to show us the very last uh, in, in his slide deck, indeed, where you see that uh, if you take a measure of liquidity risk and you divide these measures by different buckets of banks, from uh, the largest in blue to the smallest in green, you can see that while the large and medium-sized banks that are also uh, tendentially the strongest ones, uh, have this liquidity risk going down, even if the, the, there is a waxing and waning of uh, the central bank balance sheet, the smaller banks are instead accumulating more and more liquidity risk. Now, I mean, to bring about this, uh, um, this, uh, this conclusion, uh, Viral and co-authors bring uh, uh, no, to the table a compelling body of evidence. They span uh, aggregate descriptive uh, statistics to time series regressions, panel uh, bank level data to, uh, to event studies, they look at assets, liabilities, quantities, rates, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, they also refine, obviously, the causal interpretation of the coefficients using uh, an identification strategy, relying on this uh, role of banks as liquidity hubs. And they also illustrate very clearly the mechanism behind these results. That is that banks that are uh, weaker, for instance, that are lowly capitalized, tend to uh, you know, reach for yield. They try, they try to, they have all the profitability incentives stacked up to build up this uh, additional liquidity risk. Now, I mean, the, the implications of, of this paper, and this is my personal reading of the paper, is indeed that the, the risks coming from the expansion of a, of a central bank balance sheet uh, are there if regulatory and supervisory frameworks are incomplete. And in, in completing the sense that they don't cover, especially the smaller, weaker banks that are outside the, the, the scope of the prudential oversight. And if anything, the, the, if there is a bottom line message of, of the paper is indeed that the, the, the strong uh, regulatory and supervisory framework is instrumental for the transmission of monetary policy, for the smooth transmission of monetary policy. Now, um, I will have, uh, so um, I mentioned not that this is a great paper, and I don't think that on the technical uh, point of view we have much to add. It has gone through a lot of scrutiny over the past year. So if anything, I would like to bring a bit the, the Euro era perspective uh, and a bit uh, you know, what we can, which match, messages we can draw from, uh, from this paper for the Euro era. So first I will just look a bit of the, 
ongoing adjustment in the euro area to the new environment, lower liquidity environment that is emerging, which is, uh, which is gradual and understandably so, but it's also broad-based. It's broad-based in the sense that we are not only witnessing a, a decrease or a stabilization of the credit lines, but especially we are seeing very strong and potent adjustment on the on-balance sheet loan book of banks. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm going to look a bit on the non-linear effects that may be arising in this new environment of lower liquidity. And third, maybe I will spend one minute at the end of the discussion to remind ourselves of what, uh, what, which role actually these open, you know, know, these unused credit claims have played in one of the most stressful episodes we've seen in the past years, you know, the pandemic. Uh, so. Let me just uh, start from just basic facts about the evolution of uh, unused credit lines in the euro area. What you see here is the, the overall amount of credit lines, unused credit lines in the euro area that, as you can see, have gone up by, from 2 trillion in 2015 all the way to 3 trillion, all the way to the moment in which we started hiking uh, our tightening cycle. And you see that they basically stabilized from that moment onward. Now, uh, if, you actually, if we actually unpack this aggregate amount of undrawn credit lines, you can see that actually for the non-financial private sector, the yellow and blue bars, we are actually seeing a gradual, okay, it's a gradual, but still a decrease in these in this undrawn credit lines, exactly coincident with the start of our tightening cycle, especially for, household, for the household sector. And if anything, if there is one uh, no, counterpart of these uh, undrawn credit lines that is actually expanding, is the credit claims from uh, financial corporations, which might be, you know, a speculative interpretation of this might be that these uh, financial corporations are actually preparing themselves, they are building up a war chest to face the incoming lower liquidity environment that they are anticipating, but just, just a speculation. Now, moving from off-balance sheet exposures to on-balance sheet exposures, and uh, here I would have you uh, focus on the rightmost panel of this chart, you can see how massive the decrease in the loan growth has been since we started hiking. It's massive in absolute terms, and it's massive also compared to any other tightening episode we've seen. And it's even large com if we take into account the size and pace of the hikes that we have performed over the last years, which will be represented by the dash line. It's really an unprecedented slowdown in credit volumes in the euro area. So the adjustment of the balance sheet since we started hiking and since we started reducing our balance sheet has been very large. Now, uh, it's very difficult to elicit what might be behind this slowdown of uh, credit lines, uh, of, this, uh, of uh, this loan growth, but, but one thing that we can get from the soft information of banks is that if we divide banks into two groups, one with high liquidity, one with low liquidity, that's the blue and the yellow lines, uh, they faced a very similar evolution of loan demand, but they differed very, very, um, very, in a very pronounced way in terms of a way in which they tightened their credit standards. And actually, this tightening of credit standards, much more for the banks with low excess liquidity, was associated with their perception about their, their, um, their liquidity position. And perhaps even most interestingly, the most pronounced factors behind this tightening of credit standards was associated with banks' risk perceptions. It was the low uh, liquidity banks that have changed their risk attitudes in a most pronounced way since we started hiking and moderating our balance sheet, suggesting that there is this, this uh, rationale of banks actually operating in an environment where they anticipate the challenges that uh, Viral's paper is pointing to, in a way obviously helped and incentivized by the framework in which they operate in the euro area. Um, and actually, if we move to model-based evidence, we can, uh, we can confirm this extra sensitivity of uh, on-balance sheet exposures no, of, the, of the loan book to liquidity conditions. You can see here, especially on the left-hand side, how the sensitivity of loan, uh, of loan volumes to liquidity condition is especially concentrated for the withdrawal of liquidity that is not necessarily borrowed by banks just to um, satisfy their immediate liquidity needs, but instead is the sensitivity, is the sensitivity associated with the liquidity that is coming from non-borrowed reserves. 
the ones that, for instance, that accrue to banks via QE and that are withdrawn via QT mechanisms. Um, now, uh, I've talked about volumes in off-balance sheet, on-balance sheet, and even the qualitative composition of the on-balance sheet exposures, for instance, represented by the duration of the, of the loan book, has been evolving consistently with the quantity of excess liquidity floating around. What you see here is the excess liquidity over asset in the aggregate, in the euro area, against the, loan, the average loan duration of outstanding loans for households and firms in the euro area. And you can see a very clear you know, upward trend whereby duration was going up as excess liquidity was going up. And the moment we started hiking and we started moderating the, the size of the balance sheet, this has just proceeded in the opposite direction along the same trajectory. Um, now, moving on to potential nonlinear effects that might emerge from this uh, environment, here I give you a couple of perspectives that speak a bit with the exercises that Viral has, uh, has shown in his paper. On the left-hand side, you see, for instance, that there are threshold effects, whereby you do not have the sensitivity of unused credit lines to decreases or increases in excess liquidity only in a situation where the level of excess liquidity, so for banks that have high excess liquidity, is, is very high. You, this sensitivity emerges only once the banks have low excess liquidity and therefore they become ex actually very mindful of the quantity of excess liquidity that is back in their, their unused credit claims. Um, and on the right hand side, if anything, it's a way to connect the, the off-balance sheet uh, developments with the on-balance sheet. Here, I, what I look at is one of the most severe forms of credit restriction that you can think of, is rejections of loan, of loan applications. And if we mix up soft information of banks that tells us about whether they have increased the, the loan rejection rates, we can see that actually the probability of these banks reporting an increase in their rejection rates increases as a response to decreasing in excess liquidity only for the banks that have high and drawn credit lines. Again, uh, speaking to the fact that banks are internalizing the framework in which they are operating, they have regulatory and, and supervisory pressures that induce them to, uh, and also the market scrutiny, that induce them to actually moderate very abruptly, very strongly, very uh, you know, in a very pronounced way, their lending conditions in response to changes in, in the liquidity environment. Now, and uh, with this, I would just like to spend one minute on, uh, on uh, reminding ourselves on what was the role of these unused credit lines. Because sometimes we are, we are led to look at, you know, this dash for cash, these uh, drawdowns of credit lines during the pandemic as just this ominous sign of uh, financial fragility of the system. But what these two charts try to illustrate to some extent is that it's true that the loan growth that we experienced at the very height of the pandemic was associated with the amount of undrawn credit lines in the banking system, as also Viral illustrates in, in his paper. But at the same time, these credit lines, the, the fact that we had those open credit lines in place was exactly the conduit through which support to the real economy actually arrived during the pandemic, where the uh, amount of loan growth that we have experienced over that period was exactly related to the decrease in the productive capacity of the economy brought about by the pandemic and by the restriction that we have experienced in that, uh, in that period. And Interestingly, if we actually look at where, this, uh, um, where the support, the liquidity support that we have injected in, in, in that period uh, flowed, it flowed exactly to those sectors that were more affected by the drop in productive capacity. So to say that, you know, it's, uh, it's it, indeed there is a financial stability aspect to it, but there are also uh, other aspects that we should never forget and uh, when we look at these things. So, I mean, all in all, I mean, this is a, a great paper. It's very consequential. It's a must read for whoever is interested into, into the bank-based transmission of monetary policy. So if anything, if I have to think of three open questions, and with this I would conclude, 
uh, that are left uh, that are left a bit open no at the end of uh, reading the paper um, so the first one is uh, what is the right counterfactual when we assess uh, policy changes? I mean, uh, just to, um, we have seen, for instance, the role that open credit lines have uh, played during the pandemic. So one, one uh, experiment, thought experiment we should conduct is, for instance, what would have been the size of the public support measures that we would have had to adopt if we didn't have those unused credit line in place when the pandemic hit. This is one, uh, one, uh, one characteristic, and it a bit speaks with the discussion that we had this morning on this tendency, and it's a very justified tendency on looking at the contrast between uh, sh small sh uh, short-term gains against future large uh, costs no, in terms of uh, risks to the financial stability. We should think of the fact that those uh, short-term gains at times might be extremely sizable. Um, then the second question is actually what, what, it's not clear at the end what is the appropriate size and pace of the bank's balance sheet adjustment that we should expect based on the results on the paper. Is it about, uh, <clears throat> I mean, we've seen how the on balance sheet adjustment was very sizable, both in the Euro era and in the US, if you think of the SLUS, uh, the SLUS results. No? So the idea is to um, understand uh, whether after having hiked as much as it was hiked in the US and the Euro era over the last year, in an environment in which if we take at face value the results of the paper should have been more fragile than would have been otherwise, can we still think that the economy has not been tested by the, the hike that we have seen so far? And then maybe the last, uh, the last point is, it will be very interesting, you know, and perhaps it's just analytically the part that I was missing out at the end, uh, to see the later stages, obviously, of the transmission of monetary policy, especially the real effects. You know? That would be great to see in the paper. And with this, I will conclude. Viral, do you want to react to these points? And then I'll uh, open the floor. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for a great discussion. It's very interesting to think about these patterns in the Eurozone as well. Uh, my overall sense is that the credit lines are not as big in the Eurozone as they are with the American uh, banks. But I broadly agree with the one point you made, which I think has been my interpretation also, that uh, all the Fed and Treasury policies of the pandemic, they are thought of as support of the shadow banking system. My view is that ultimately they were actually support of the banking system because all the shadow banks were running on bank credit lines. And banks had about, just through large companies, I think about $320 billion of withdrawals in less than four weeks. That was larger than the entire year of bank credit line drawdowns. So I think the counterfactual of these drawdowns on bank credit lines would have really exceeded uh, quite, quite a bit. And I think if you look at bank stock prices during the pandemic, until the vaccines came, bank stock prices didn't recover very well. One there were losses on the existing loans. But also when a credit line gets drawn down and uh, becomes sort of like a term loan, it's not technically a term loan because it can be repaid back, uh, it's a revolver. Uh, but it has a greater capital encumbrance once it is drawn down than when it is not drawn. And so that there are some papers which are showing that banks that had more credit line drawdowns didn't lend as much to small businesses uh, in the aftermath of all this. So, so that would get to the real side of this thing, which is that at least in case of credit lines, uh, when the fragility manifested, there was an immediate impact on small businesses because banks acted until vaccines came as though they were capital constrained. Uh, then the stock prices also started doing better and then things got relaxed. But I agree. I haven't seen a good paper which is looking at the current stress of the actual runs on banks. Uh, I hear mixed things. Some people are saying, no, this is just like an interest rate pass through, even though 
runs occurred, we have backstopped it and nothing terrible is happening beyond what high interest rates would have done. But I think we have to wait a few quarters to really tease out that data. But thank you. Thank you. I, are, uh, I don't see uh, comments or questions coming through the, the chat line, but um, I'm sure in the floor there will be, there will be some. So, yeah. From the Bank of Italy. So your story is about the, the asymmetry between QE and QT in the ratio between deposit and reserves. But something else also can change this ratio and was something that happened after the COVID. And this was the debt to GDP ratio. So if the amount of new government bonds is purchased by banks, initially you just have a change in the asset side of banks, but then when the government expand the money, this also increased deposits, and in particular it increased the deposit to reserve ratio. So I'm wondering how you disentangle these two effects, the one that you attribute to QT and the one that could come from this side. Yeah, maybe if I can quickly respond because I don't remember questions very well. So, yeah, it's a great question. I couldn't show you this. Uh, so, the data we have is only quarterly because we are using company, uh, you know, bank call reports. But what you can do is during the, say, from Q4 of 19 until Q1 of 22, which is, which is what we are calling as pandemic QE, you can see the sensitivity of uninsured demandable deposits to reserves and insured demandable deposits to reserves. And there are three quarters when fiscal stimulus took place, which is, I think, Q2, Q4 of 20, and then Q1 of 21. And what you see is that the, the positive relation between insured demandable deposits and reserves comes entirely from the fiscal stimulus quarters. So fiscal stimulus seems to be a predominant driver of insured, de insured deposits. And so while it is expanding the stock of deposits, it's expanding more the stock of deposits, which is relatively more stable. In contrast, QE, so the uninsured demandable deposits to change in reserves is robust, whether you look at fiscal stimulus quarters or whether you look at non-fiscal stimulus quarters. In non-fiscal stimulus quarters, it's only the central bank that's doing the reserves expansion. And so, it, so I think my sense is that there was a bit of stimulus that went to companies, and that would have created uninsured demandable deposits. But in terms of the slope, it's not a very strong relationship. It's really QE which created the large stock of uninsured demandable deposits. We, we have the charts in the paper, actually. Uh, Anna Samarina, Dutch Central Bank. Uh, thank you for interesting presentation. Uh, in view of uh, the evidence that you provide, uh, especially what you mentioned about the differences between large banks and the small ones, uh, there might be some concerns of the fragmentation raising up in the financial system. So um, uh, in that sense, I was wondering uh, whether you see the role for redistribution uh, of reserves across the, the banking system, and whether you observe uh, uh, this already in the data. Uh, as I imagine, as the QT goes on, there might be more need for this redistribution from large banks to small ones uh, with uh, not that much liquidity. Uh, related to that, um, there is this ongoing debate about the revival of the interbank market as the amount of uh, central bank reserves shrink. So um, how do you see the potential and feasibility of reviving the interbank market to support this uh, redistribution? So... Uh I, I think what we are uh, seeing is that large banks don't seem to be that keen, actually, to lend to the smaller banks. We saw that in the recent episode. Even during the repo market stress, I think JP Morgan, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon openly said that I have to keep my reserves for resolution planning and LCR management. Now, they did relax the rules a little bit after that as to whether they are doing every night or every fortnight sort of averaging. But I think uh, we seem to have effectively gotten rid of the uninsured interbank market. 
sort of unsecured, sorry, not unsecured, it's also uninsured, but it's also, I, I meant unsecured interbank market. And uh, so I think in a way that would only increase the liquidity dependence on the central bank in my view, which is that if, if the reserves are disproportionately ending up with the large banks, and either because of regulation or market power, they are not willing to provide support to the smaller banks when stress arises, <coughs> then in a way it's even more the demands on the central bank to inject liquidity in midst of QT will be even stronger. And so, you know, I think it's not great for a central bank if your one arm is doing quantitative tightening, so it's selling securities in the market every day, while your other arm is doing lender of last resort, which is sort of injecting reserves against securities. And I think that's the sort of scenario I think that means at, at the end of the day, it's got to have some impact on the monetary policy. I think. I think there's a couple more questions. Yeah. yeah. So the asymmetry between the QE and the QT, what is bringing is this in your paper, this fragility on the liability of banks. And we know by, by banking theory, by, by practice, that this fragility on the liability, it might imply a change in the lending and the risk taking in the asset side. Have you considered analyzing this part? Do you think that this part is equally important? <coughs> the fragility on the liability? Yeah, so I, I think this was also Lorenzo's point. I think we haven't yet traced out the real impact of this. And one reason why we have been a bit reluctant is because with quarterly data, it's a little hard to tease it, pin it down very precisely. So it turns out that if you work inside the Fed, you have access to the daily reserves and daily liabilities because for liquidity coverage ratio uh, calculations, they are now actually getting this overnight data. So uh, I'm hoping to work with some co-authors at the Fed to see if we can, so one, we can actually tease out some of these, these relationships much more tightly because when a QE happens, you can see exactly that night whose deposits are changing. They also know which type of deposits are these. Are these corporate transaction deposits? Are these uh, non-bank financial firms deposits? They have it at that level of granularity. So you would know exactly what kind of deposits are getting created. So, and then I think uh, once you are able to reconstruct the banking system's balance sheet on a daily basis after a QE shock occurs, or a QT shock occurs, then you can start tracing it out, okay, over the next three weeks or four weeks, how did that then impact the lending decisions of the banking system and so on. So I think it's, it's probably best done at that level of time granularity rather than using quarterly data because the shocks won't give you too much to trace out. Oh, sure. Deposit the money, right? No, but no, that we don't know because they are not keeping because yeah, yeah because the, for that you need to know when a bank acts yeah. as a counterparty of the Fed whether they are acting on their own behalf or whether they are acting on behalf of a customer. They should ideally collect the data, but they, I don't think they are collecting the data. Well, okay, I have a question here <clears throat> from uh, Enrico Perotti. Smaller banks may have, or believe they have, a more stable deposit base. Perhaps this is why they responded less to the worst liquidity position in QT. Alternatively, do you see, as a, different, do you see a differential inclination to take risk? Yeah, so everything that we showed was all mostly focused on uninsured demandable deposits. So those are not stable for small banks, if anything, if a small bank becomes vulnerable, they don't have access to capital <clears throat> markets to raise capital, et cetera. So I think small banks may be more stable in terms of some of the other deposits, but here the ratcheting up that I showed is all on the back of uninsured demandable deposits. So. There's one question, very, very brief, please. Yes. Sure, sure, okay. Um, so this is a fascinating asymmetry that you have shown, uh, Viral. Um, is it, do you see kind of um, 
it being driven by some kind of fundamental underlying force, or is it, was it driven by some kind of um, particular aspects of these episodes when the QE and QT kind of happened? And related to that kind of, are there some kind of policy measures that one could consider to address this issue that you are kind of? Uh, yeah, so I, I think, so, so I think the credit lines make it perhaps the most easy to understand the asymmetry because in a way, so suppose you have a stock of reserves and banks sold credit lines, typical maturity is say about three years on the revolver. Then just because reserves left the system, they cannot just pull all these lines back. So the demandable claim remains, even though the reserves in the system are shrinking. They can reduce the origination of new revolvers, but now that's going to take two or three years for the stock to gradually start adjusting. But then, as I was saying, shocks will come and hit in between. And so I think there is a fundamental problem that the scale of your operation is going to take so long to unwind and, and it's coincident with the creation of demandable claims. So if a shock comes along the way, most likely you'll be back in the situation of injecting liquidity. I think we have to stop. Okay, yeah, okay. We, we need to. Okay, we'll talk over coffee break. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So we move to the, the second paper, uh, David, please. Thank you. Is it working? Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me to present this paper, which is joint work with Annette. Uh, we started this, uh, this paper, I think it's going to complement what, what Viral just said, because we, we started this paper from a, from a different perspective, which is now the financial stability side. We, we, we thought pretty much about the monetary policy side, about the question that I'm going to just put here are, are, are related to monetary policy, mainly to uh, the operational implementation of monetary policy, depending on how do you think about the size of the balance sheet. So somehow they complement uh, what, what, uh, what the Bidal side was emphasizing. Uh, the title is, is, is quite also explicit about what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand the demand for reserve. I want to emphasize that we're not looking at the supply side, which is probably what Vidal was emphasizing in most of his talk. So here the perspective is to have like a some sort of way of framing of thinking about uh, the demand uh, for reserve coming from the banking sector and the extent to which once we understand that, we can use that to think about how do we do interest rate control and how do we think about quantitative easing uh, and quantitative tightening in particular in this paper. So I'm going to try to see if this works. Yeah. So everybody probably knows what is in this slide. So you pre-financial crisis, but it's going to set the stage. We have a conventional way of thinking about monetary policy, at least in the, in the U.S., where the supply or reserve was pretty small. Uh, the reserve didn't pay uh, any interest. And the Fed basically could adjust uh, with open market operation to change the short-term interest rate, in particular the effective funds rate, with a relatively small change in the supply of, uh, of reserves. Uh, the financial crisis uh, and the zero lower bound create room for unconventional policy, uh, mainly forward guidance and QE. But uh, the, the point of this paper is to emphasize this part of the QE. So uh, the supply uh, of reserve expanded quite massively. That's, uh, I was uh, pretty clear when you look at the size of the, of the central bank balance sheet across the world, uh, uh, measure in terms of the GDP. And importantly, the Fed started to pay interest on reserves. So this is a new framework uh, uh, in which we, we need to start thinking uh, uh, about. And this is what the paper was, was pretty much uh, uh, focusing on. What's the role of the demand for reserve uh, in thinking about the extent to which the Fed can control the interest rate uh, when you have an ample reserve demand? And how do we think about the use of reserve demand to guide or to offer any guidance on, on the interest rate control and interest rate volatility uh, uh, and the extent to which we understand the reserve demand, how that uh, is going to uh, uh, matter for thinking about uh, interest rate control. So in thinking about this 
questions where we, we start thinking about do we have a framework? Can we elaborate a simple framework uh, to think about these issues? And the first thing that we did was to think about reserve demand coming from banks, optimization problem, and the extent to which we can use a simple model to try to uh, uh, understand that. Then uh, once we start thinking about demand, we, we need to put uh, the supply uh, uh, in place. So we thought about, can we think about an equilibrium uh, uh, in, the, in the reserve market? So putting supply and demand together. And the extent to what this is important in thinking about what I said before, which is uh, interest rate control. And in particular for the, the case of the US, uh, these uh, overnight uh, reverse repo and take up that we've seen uh, uh, after uh, COVID. So with that in mind, uh, that's gonna be the first part of my presentation. Then uh, we, we, we took a look at the data and we tried to estimate the demand for reserve. And once we have the demand for reserve, we can do a bunch of things. Uh, and uh, in particular, if I have time, I will talk a little bit about this controllability aspect and the extent to which we when you start moving away from the flat part of the demand, you need to think about uh, how that matter uh, for uh, control of the interest rate as you start shrinking the size of the balance sheet. That's kind of what we, what we try to address. So let's start with the, with the demand uh, for reserves. So to demand, to derive the demand for reserve from bank optimization, I'm not gonna go into the detail. The paper has a lot of technical detail, but you can think about uh, the, uh, uh, the balance sheet of a bank. On the other side, you have, uh, Birad just was showing before, reserves, securities, and loans. On the liability side, we have deposit, Fed funds, potentially repo, and equity. Uh, so the, the key point that we borrow from the work of an equity with, with Arving is that banks would always be managing uh, the demand for reserve uh, to uh, manage uh, you know, liquid claim that they have issued, issued, so basically deposits. So mainly liquid deposits. So in the context of narrow banking in the past, reserve and deposit they were pretty much the same. Uh, in a system in which you have fractional reserve banking, uh, reserve by construction or a fraction of these deposits, in the context of ample reserves, you can think of a reserve being a function of many things, this proxy for liquidity, uh, the spread between the federal funds rate and the IOER deposits. And that's precisely this idea of how do we think about demand for reserve in this context of a large balance sheet, what we're trying to capture with our paper. To do that, uh, um, we're gonna emphasize this idea of convenience yield, that I, that I, as I mentioned before. So uh, as, I, as I noticed in the previous slide, the Fed now is paying uh, starting in 2008, interest on reserve. So IOR uh, will be very important for thinking about the demand for reserve. The second aspect of the model will be to emphasize that reserve has a liquid uh, benefits for the banks are demanding. And might not, bank, basically the banks may not need to sell illiquid asset if the deposits drop. That's, a, that's, a, that's one of the key insights that this uh, simple theory is gonna be uh, putting uh, in, in front of us. So we're gonna have a function that capture this convenience value, which is pretty much the expected transaction cost uh, savings from excess reserve. That is gonna yield to what we call a convenience yield, which is the, uh, you know, uh, the properties of this function, in particular the first order uh, uh, condition is gonna be a function of the, uh, of the derivative of this uh, function, this convenience value function. And this is gonna be a, a fundamental part of the convenience yield, uh, which is pretty much the marginal value of additional reserve that is gonna be decreasing in reserve and increasing in deposits. So with this simple model, we're gonna have a downward sloping demand for reserve coming from banks. If the banks have a declining marginal value of holding any additional uh, reserve, for managing a given amount of deposits. So controlling for the bank deposit as a demand shifter is gonna be key in our empirical analysis. Other aspect of the model will include that the banks are gonna face some balance sheet costs per dollar of asset. This is a parameter phi there. Because of you know, different frictions or different regulations, you have some in the slides, 
And if you think about, uh, you know, posting, uh, you know, collateral in the repo borrowing, you might want to think about these, uh, uh, you know, foregone security lending revenues with this capture, capturing by this function W. So all this is going to get into the simple bank optimization. So this is a slide that show the profits of the bank. That is, you know, uh, what you earn from holding reserves, securities, uh, and loans minus what you pay for the passes and for private repo, uh, plus this convenience value that is going to be the function B uh, as a function of reserve and deposit, minus this cost of uh, you know, uh, balance sheet cost and posting in the private repo. So we can define efficiency condition for borrowing in the federal funds rate, borrowing in the repo market against you know, investing in reserve or borrowing via deposit, investing in reserve. In, in all these cases, you have a condition like one, two, and three. I'm going to just emphasize one, which is the one that we'll be using, is the uh, 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 mm, uh, uh, market interest rate will be the highest interest rate the bank will be willing to pay to borrow to invest in reserve. And this is going to be equal to the net benefit of holding the reserve, which is, in our case, the LER, plus this uh, uh, um, convenient yield aspect, B prime R, which I will specify in a second, that captured this idea that I mentioned before, adjusted by uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, um, the parameter phi we capture the uh, the cost, uh, the balance sheet cost of the of the bank. So uh, that simple model give us this nicely looking downward sloping demand for reserves. Uh, that's I said before is just uh, coming out of these first order conditions that you have on the top right of the slide. So the demand for reserve depends on the interest uh, on reserve. Uh, the this, this liquidity benefit of reserve uh, and the bank's balance sheet cost uh, phi parameter. Uh, uh, this demand for reserve that is downward sloping will be shifting up and down depending on this uh, bank balance sheet, balance sheet cost and the IOER and the shape, the elasticity of this demand for different values of reserve and for different value of deposit will be a function of this uh, uh, convenience value or convenience yields uh, function that we will need to estimate. Uh, one interesting result of this simple model is that if the convenience yield from a uh, reserve goes to zero, then the reserve demand uh, has an asymptote that approach to this uh, uh, floor, which is the IOUR adjusted by the cost, the balance sheet cost of the bank. And Another important insight of this simple framework is that we can define the demand for reserve relative to any source of funding uh, for holding reserve. So uh, there are many markets, including the repo market. So we can define these costs for liquidity, this idea of convenience yield relative to many. In, in, the, in the paper, we emphasize relative to the federal funds rate market, but we can use other rates. Uh, if you think about the reserve supply, uh, to, to think about the, uh, the, the demand and supply and how the equilibrium will be determined in the reserve market. So uh, this is the uh, uh, Federal Reserve balance sheet up to uh, the end of June in 2023, which is the age four. Uh, uh, four. So the Fed had uh, on the asset side, treasuries and MBS or securities for almost $7 trillion, a little bit of loans to banks. Uh, and other assets, uh, but pretty much, as you can see on the asset side, are uh, treasuries and MBS. Those are, you can think about the government securities there. And on the liability side, we have reserves, uh, overnight reverse repo uh, for almost uh, another $5 trillion. We have, and then we have uh, uh, some kind of shifter, autonomous factor, like uh, the tre treasury general account, currency, and other factors. Uh, so if you think about the Federal Reserve uh, 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 from the perspective of the supply of reserve, uh, the way we like to organize this is uh, by thinking that the amount of reserve is just uh, securities adjusted by the autonomous factor. This is what we call net securities, plus some loan to bank that you can see are pretty much negl negligible. Uh, and this reserve will be the net securities uh, 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 adjusted by these non-bank investment facility, which are reserved 
lend to the central bank by non-banks. This is something that uh, you know, uh, Vera also emphasized. So uh, a key aspect, a key identification of our demand is to think about can we trace out some shifter that move the supply of reserve so we can actually think about pin down the slope of the demand. So that's what pretty much will be what we'll be emphasizing. So total assets corrected by the autonomous factor uh, uh, is, is going to be a fantastic instrument in thinking about the joint uh, reserve and over an IRP uh, estimation. But before getting there, uh, I'm going to put together the demand, the, the, the nice looking downward sloping demand with the supply. The supply have different form, so it's not the usual vertical line uh, to the net securities, uh, uh, because at the lending facility rate and at the non-bank facility rate, the, uh, the Fed will be uh, uh, supplying elastically uh, any amount of reserve at, th at those rates. So depending on the case uh, in which the lending facility for banks is open, but there is no investment facility for non-banks, there is no lower bound. Uh, but if you introduce an investment facility for non-banks, then you get the non-bank facility rate, which actually is bounded. Uh, uh, the equilibrium in the, uh, in the money market rate R that you can see there. So uh, there are different, of course, you can think about combining the demand with the supply. As I said before, you can see at least three ways of thinking about the equilibrium. This is the standard, you know, in which, you know, you can see that the demand, the downward sloping demand is crossing on the uh, inelastic uh, uh, part of the supply. So uh, the demand and the supply cross above the non-bank facility rate. And this is the case in which, as you can see in the title, there's no take up at the investment facility for non-banks. So you can see that the, the locus of the, of the, equilib the equilibrium will change. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the spread of the uh, uh, market rate will be moving depending on uh, factor that are moving the demand for reserve, uh, IOER, deposits, the, uh, the banking costs, and potentially the amount of net securities uh, and non-bank facility rate. If the reserve demand evaluated at a market rate equal to the non-bank facility rate, and that is below the amount of what I call their net security, so in the case of, you remember what I put there, net reserve in this equilibrium is equal to, sorry, reserve is equal to net securities. If, if this is not the case, then we can have two situations one in which uh, uh, there will be a positive take up at the investment facility by non-banks. So you actually see the demand shifting downward and crossing at the uh, non-bank facility rate. Uh, and the other equilibrium would be one in which there will be a take up at the lending facility for banks. And you can see that this year uh, crossing and the equilibrium is found uh, at, the, at the lending facility rates. So, in this case, uh, in, in which you, you cross at the non-bank facility rate, the difference between reserve and net securities is what is called the non-bank facility. This is what is right now uh, uh, happening, which is we have a bunch of overnight uh, reverse repo that are sitting in our balance sheet. Um, in, 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 for some of you that are familiar with the uh, or with the with the with the past history of of of, of uh, money banking uh, in the U.S., this is what uh, in the past was called non-borrower reserve, as opposed to this sort of equilibrium that is uh, uh, showing borrower reserve, which is the case in which reserves are about the net uh, net securities. Okay, so uh, key takeaways from this, and I'm 17 minutes old. That's fine. So key takeaways. Uh, the central bank can, in principle, control this, uh, the short market interest rate. Uh, it does that with administered uh, rates, IOER in our case, uh, the rate of a lending facility, which is the discount window, and the rate of this investment facility for non-banks, the overnight uh, reverse repo facility. And on top of that, uh, they have a choice for the net securities, too, uh, on the, uh, on the, on the uh, balance sheet. So the role of the central bank lending facility for banks and investment facility for non is very important. And one of the key lessons that uh, is important to take into account is that the private sector will use these facilities and by using these facilities will change the equilibrium supply of reserve endogenously to keep the market clearing interest rate 
in a particular desire range. So uh, this is a very simple policy framework, uh, and most of the time has been successful uh, to control interest rate. And the effective federal fund rate has been clearly in target uh, in the target range, except during Sundays in September 2019. Now we can talk probably after my presentation about what will happen in there. But most of the time, it's extremely successful. So uh, this part of the presentation is try to estimate this demand for reserve using data, uh, monthly data starting 2009 until 2022. Uh, so to do that, we specify a functional for for this uh, convenience uh, yield aspect. Um, we borrow from Lucas uh, in Econometrica in 2000, thinking about basic model of money demand. And we specify uh, something that it was working great in the data. It's kind of a semi-lock. So this uh, convenient yield is a function of the lock of reserve and the lock of deposit. What happened uh, uh, when we look at the demand with this uh, functional form, the semi-lock show up that the spread between the uh, market rate and the IOR that uh, um, uh, Viral was emphasizing, this, this, this convenience yield, so liquidity uh, uh, component, is, is a function of uh, the uh, lock of reserve and deposit. Plus, you know, uh, because we're going to look at the data, we're adding some exogenous shifter UT uh, there. So you can see that from estimating the parameter B and C and A, we can back up. Uh, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma, which will be a uh, deep parameter specifying the semi-log function uh, that we have in mind for thinking about how the demand for reserve is a function of the scale deposit and the uh, 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 spread between the market rate and the IOER, as you can see in the slide. Very simple, pretty straightforward. So let's look at the data. Uh, uh, I'm going to show uh, in this slide something that we already emphasized from, from a slightly different perspective. You see that deposit went up. Uh, this is the deposit growth in the United States starting in 85. So you see that the deposits went up a lot during the 2009 to 2022, which is our, our sample period, even relative to GDP. This is, uh, no matter what you look at these, uh, either the small or large time deposits, H6 or H8 uh, form, uh, you see this uh, 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 run up in the demand for deposit, a little less so for a small and a large deposit. <clears throat> How do we take this, this into account? Well, let's look at the data. And this is uh, going to, for, for many of you, this is going to be something very familiar. So if you try to estimate this demand for liquidity, you see all kind of shifted around. So there's no sense of stability when you look at the spread and reserve, no matter whether you scale a reserve by GDP, uh, no matter what sample period you look at. So you see these kind of, you know, shift up and down uh, that, uh, you know, uh, in the past people call changes in velocity. So... The key contribution of the paper on thinking about the demand for reserve is that controlling for the amount of bank deposit is very important to get a stable relationship of the one that I presented just a minute ago. So when you do that, uh, you'll see what happened. So let's take uh, this equation to the data. And I was uh, pointing before that, of course, reserves are non-exogenous in this regression, and deposits are not exogenous. So we try to identify these parameters, think, making an effort of what a potentially good instrument for reserve and deposit. I'm going to get to that uh, in turn here. So in thinking about reserve, just by looking at the basic uh, insight from Jim Hamilton, JP 9095, is that you might want to find exogenous supply shifter coming from autonomous factor that's going to trace out, help on identify this V prime R. So in our case, it's kind of really nice to just using the identity coming from the central bank balance sheet that the, the amount of reserve and over an IRP is what we call net securities in the previous chart, which is the difference between securities and autonomous factors. All this is controlled in an exogenous way by the central bank. So this is our candidate for being a good instrument for uh, our reserves. And um, of course, deposits are not exogenous. And we'll try to instrument deposits 
just looking at something that uh, we thought it could be also interesting in, in thinking about this equation, which is bringing the household financial assets. So thinking about the real side of the economy and the extent to which deposit are part of an asset for uh, uh, household in this economy. And it turns out that this is, uh, this is uh, also very uh, natural and interesting instrument, as I will show you in a minute, plus the level of IOER. Controlling by this IOER or not really doesn't change the result much, as I will show. So briefly, what you can see here is the uh, estimate of the uh, equation that I just had on the previous slide. The panel A is the second stage, so we run the uh, uh, um, spread between the market rate and the IOER on reserve and deposit. You can see in the shaded area, extremely significant and with the right sign. So it depends uh, positively on deposit, negatively on reserve, which is a downward sloping, nicely uh, looking demand curve. And, and the first stage is put in there to see that also uh, we're, we're actually close to a demand. We, we, you never guarantee that this is a demand, but at least the exclusion restrictions of this simple oil is, is, is working nicely. So you see that uh, deposit doesn't enter into the first stage and reserve and overnight RP is a really nice uh, 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 nicely correlated with uh, with uh, with reserve, which is a great instrument. Uh, so that's that's uh, uh, pretty encouraging. So what we do now is to translate this uh, uh, reduced for estimate into uh, the parameter that uh, we have in the semi-lock specification of our B prime function. This is done in this slide. So we translate this parameter into a semi-elasticity of the demand reserve with respect to the interest rate spread. Uh, and what we got there is a 10 basis point change in the spread leads to an increase in reserve holdings by 50%. So it's a pretty flat uh, demand. I'll show you exactly what I mean by pretty flat, but not totally flat. So it's a pretty elastic demand for reserve, what we find for the US during this sample period. Um, on top of that, uh, we also uh, can identify the elasticity of this demand for reserve relative to deposit. And this elasticity is slightly about 1.5%. So 1% one incre one increase in deposit increase reserve demand by more than a 1%. So this is kind of the other side of the coin of what Biral was emphasizing uh, uh, in his presentation. So uh, what do we mean by flat demand? So you see here uh, uh, how the model works. So this is uh, in sample, the feed of the, uh, of the model, uh, the blue and the red line tells you the combination over time uh, uh, of uh, the effective uh, federal funds rate relative to the IOER and the fitted value. So it, it's a pretty nice fit. Uh, nothing that make us think that this, this equation has been affected by QT and QE and different QE. So it's, the overall fit is kind of nice. As you can see on the scatter plot on the right, there's no sense of large uh, uh, shocks and most of the uh, dots are well uh, close to uh, the theta line, except the one that you see there on the top left, which is the one in 2019 uh, September, which is the, uh, what happened in the particular repo market. Um, we can talk about that, but overall, the fit is, is, is really nice uh, and, and and you can see that this flat, but not completely flat. That's what I mean by very elastic. Okay, so uh, why did deposit grow? Uh, uh, there's an increased deposit demand. So we look at this uh, from the perspective, of, as I said before, can we just instrument the deposit in the banking sector? And we'll look at the, uh, the real side of the economy in particular, uh, uh, by looking at the flow funds, we look at the financial uh, asset of the household. You can see that yet, Financial assets have been trending up, as you can see on the left panel, since 1985, dramatically. So when we put the increase in deposit relative to this run up in the financial assets of the household, you see that deposit relative to financial asset has been pretty stable. So, so the way we think about that is, well, 
you can think about portfolio choice here from the size of the, of, the, of the household, which is giving you a stationary fraction of the financial wealth allocated in these deposits. So we use this instrument uh, as potentially useful to see whether the previous specification get affected by it. Uh, so this is the, uh, 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 what happened with the previous estimate. So the panel A, uh, uh, again, is just the second stage, now instrumenting both variables. The results are extremely similar, slightly different, of course, but the elasticity is at ballpark. And the panel B are the first stages. As again, you see that we have reserve instrumented by autonomous factor adjusted, securities adjusted by autonomous factor, which is reserve and overnight IRP, extremely significant. Financial asset, exclusion restriction, doesn't enter there in the same way that deposit didn't enter, but are very highly correlated with deposit, as you can see on the second column of the panel B. So there's potentially useful instrument that doesn't change significantly what we have in the previous specification and, and that make us, you know, uh, kind of happy in the sense that maybe this is really capturing something that proxy a demand for reserve coming from the banking sector. This is the feed of the model, seems very stable again regardless of whether we have different QEs and different QTs, there's a small size and barely autocorrelated velocity shocks in this specification. So in the next five minutes, I'm gonna to try to use this simple framework to tell something about what are the implications for interest rate control and in thinking about QT, um, uh, thinking about QT from the perspective of the controllability of the short-term interest rate. Uh, by the central bank. So to that end, I introduce a concept that was developed theoretically in a paper by Bianchi and BG in Econometric in 2022, which is this idea of the ISO Fed uh, funds curve, which is very straightforward given what I just showed you already. So an ISO Fed funds curve is useful because it gives you a combination of the IOER and reserve plus overnight RP that imply a predictive effective federal funds rate equal to a particular choice. You give me a value of the effective federal funds rate and I can trace out combination of IOER and this reserve and overnight that can achieve a particular value for this uh, uh, market rate. So uh, how do we do that? You see that in the bullet uh, 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 in red, so you you give me a value for the uh, uh, federal funds rate, I know the interest on reserve, and given my specification, I know the parameters A, B, and C, and I can evaluate this, computing what you have in the panel on the left. What you can see in the panel on the left, those are the ISO federal funds rate curve, give me a combination of uh, liabilities of the central bank and IOER that deliver an equilibrium rate a 2% or 4% federal funds rate. You can see that this is tracing out billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, okay, that are reflecting the elasticity that I previously estimated. So to achieve you know, a certain uh, federal funds rate, you see that the steepness of this ISO Fed is pretty large when the uh, uh, balance sheet size is becoming smaller and smaller, but it's relatively flat for relatively large size of the balance sheet. That's important for what's coming next. And what's coming next is how much then uh, uh, reserve and overnight RP, the liability sides of the, of, the, of the central bank can be adjusted or reduced in a way that you, by moving away from the flat part of the demand, interest rate become not very volatile. So what we do here is to use the specification that, I estimate, that we estimate to uh, run this uh, counterfactual. And to do that, one important insight is that these calculations depends on 
the level of deposit in the banking sector. For each level of deposit in the banking sector, which is our scale variable, you can identify this uh, trade-off that you see there. So what we do there is just imagine that we set the deposit at the value of the end of 2022, which are around you know, 17, 18 trillion dollars. For that, uh, mm, we say that reserve and overnight IRP are, as I showed you before, around $5 trillion, close to 20% now, a lot less now. So the, the, the calculation that you see there is that uh, to achieve a rate that is tighter than the one that we saw in September 2019, which is this uh, uh, spike in the federal funds rate that we observed at that point, you need to actually move the size of the balance sheet to, in our case, a little less than $2 uh, trillion, 7% of GDP. If you want to keep the same spread as with the one that we saw in September 2019, it becomes a little bit, you know, more than $2.8 trillion, around 11% of GDP. Or if you want to set that spread to zero, maybe enough to avoid any kind of daily uh, a spike, in, the, uh, in that, in that uh, uh, rate, then the size of the balance sheet needs to be uh, substantially larger, uh, around $3.5 trillion. And of course, these estimates will change, as Biral was emphasizing, depending on the deposit in the banking sector. For different value of the deposit, this, this number will change. And of course, this will, this will be evolving, assuming that uh, uh, we keep even constant the estimate uh, a, B, uh, and C in the specification that you have there. Uh, of course, using a standing repo facility may help uh, to uh, 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 get these uh, uh, numbers right. So uh, this is slide, which is uh, almost uh, 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 my final one, uh, summarize how much reserve and over an IRP, which are these liability, can be reduced, uh, assuming that you know, what I show you is a ballpark reasonable estimate. We think that these estimates are gonna be, if anything, a little bit conservative. Why? Well, we don't have, we haven't taken into account, just give me one minute, Massimo, please. Uh, so we introduced the standing repo facility in July 2021. That makes dealers uh, and depository institution uh, able to borrow, as you all know, uh, funds from the Federal, fund, uh, from the Federal Reserve uh, using repo borrowing. And that may help in reducing any additional volatility of any spike that you can see for a given level of reserve and over an IRP. And then, uh, Volatility on the autonomous factor is important to take into account, so it might be prudent also to take that in consideration, uh, given our estimates, uh, in a way that may induce, you know, undesirable volatility. Uh, and QT uh, may lower deposits, so but it also can increase uh, 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 deposit. It may not necessarily reduce deposit. Uh, QT may reduce deposit in the banking sector if the household buy more bonds even directly or indirectly uh, 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 through bonds funds or money market funds, who actually will be investing in the treasury repo. Someone mentioned uh, something of that sort here. But also QT may not necessarily reduce deposit if the overnight uh, RP take up falls uh, with reduction in the uh, amount of you know, total security adjusted by the autonomous factor. And more, the money market fund just replaced overnight RP with, re with private repo or you know, hedge funds or other leverage investor may hold more uh, bonds in the repo markets. I'm gonna stop here and I thank you all very much. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you. So thank you for um, this great presentation, very interesting paper. Um, yeah, for the time that my slide has put on, let me thank the organizers have, for having me to present this, um, to discuss this paper, and of course the usual disclaimer apply. Okay. Um, this being said, to summarize the paper, I think this paper makes a great work in terms of ticking all the boxes of what to expect from nice papers. No? Good model, very tractable, very nice, very elegant then nice uh, estimation, and finally policy exercise that directly speak to a hot topic that is currently monetary tightening. So in terms of, um, of models, uh, 
The author designed a reserve uh, demand and supply model that um, speaks to the control of the short-term policy rates and that embeds all the key elements you want. Starting with supply, we start with the level of uh, net securities, that is the vertical red line that you see on the top chart. And that is the initial uh, reserve that the bank, central bank is supplying to the entire banking system. Then uh, it is also willing to lend to, to let uh, any amount of um, reserve to banking sector at the lending facility rate, providing the banking sector has enough, uh, has enough uh, collateral that uh, triggers the left, the right, sorry, uh, horizontal red line. And it is also, if it implements an overnight uh, rep uh, reverse repurchase facility, willing, central bank is willing to absorb any quantity of reserve that the non-banks are willing to deposit at the central bank. By moving cash from the banking system to the central bank, it decreases reserves. Regarding demand, um, the, the key is, um, demand function is the following, that banks are willing to pay for an additional um, unit of reserves. What they get, what the monetary yield that they get from uh, depositing these uh, reserves at the central bank, which is the IOR, and the convenience yield that it gets from this um, unit of reserve, that depends on the initial amount of reserves it has, and it decreases, this convenience yield decreases with the initial reserves, because the more reserves you have, the less, the less you care about any additional unit of reserves. But it increases, and that's key in the model and the estimation, it increases with deposits. When you have more deposits on your liability side, you want to self-insure against pot, uh, potential outflows on your liability side by having liquid reserves on your asset side. And final, um, final item, your, the, this fee parameter that, is, that captures the balance sheet cost of running a, high, a large balance sheet that typically can be um, uh, a proxy for the leverage ratio requirements that were introduced after, that were introduced after the great financial crisis. Then making some assumption of on the shape of this uh, VR prime function, the authors arrive at um, the main equation that is colored here, and it is very nice in two ways. First, it links the, um, t the main policy target rate of the central bank, that is in green, that is the effective fund fund rate for the Federal Reserve, with two, its two main policy instruments that are in red, which is first uh, the IOR, so it's a remuneration rate on reserves, and second, the amount of reserves that it push on, on, on the system, push on the system. And it creates an interaction between those two instruments when you want to target a particular Fed fund rate, meaning that the more reserves you had in, have in the system, and because this B, this B coefficient is negative, the more, the more reserves you have, the lower the spreads, the spread between the effective Fed fund rate and the IOR. Meaning, for instance, that if you implement a QT, quantity tightening, you reduce the reserves, which increases the spread that you need to keep between the, um, the Fed fund rate and the IOR to keep the Fed fund rate at the target level. And the second nice feature with this equation is, of course, that, yeah, you can estimate it, actually. And the, the authors do it in the second step, and they find the bottom chart that you, you have on this slide that shows a very tight uh, fit of this um, of, of uh, this, this spread, suggesting that first, the model is adequate in capturing the main uh, elements, the main drivers of this demand equation, and second, that the coefficients are stable, which is something that I will discuss in a, in a minute. And the authors insist that it's key to obtain this fit, that uh, we, you control for demand into the equation, uh, for deposit, sorry, into the equation, which suggests that deposits are a key driver of reserve demand. Banks really want to self-insure from deposit outflows with, um, by holding reserves. Next, the authors use this estimated uh, reserve demand equation to run two policy exercises to guide policy, uh, monetary policy tightening. First, they wonder what is the IOR that is feasible for a target effective fund fund rate and a target um, path of QT. As I told you, the uh, lower the reserves, the higher the spread between I, uh, f effective fund fund rate and the, IO and the IOR which means that as you reduce reserves, you must also reduce the IOR to keep the effective fund fund rate uh, stable. And this is what you have on the left uh, top chart. When you reduce reserves and you move on the left toward uh, of the x-axis, you have also to reduce the IOR that is on the y-axis. Second policy exercise, what is the possible QT, total tightening, that you could implement 
without making the, uh, the effective infant rate too volatile, which means for the author, without having a too large spread between the effective infant rate and the IOR. And they, find, they make several uh, scenarios, and what I, I think is their preferred one is to finally reach $3.5 trillion uh, of remaining um, net securities that would leave the spread at zero, which you consider um, well, uh, good enough not to have too many spikes on um, the effective fund for the rate. Finally, doing all that, they also find that deposits affect reserves, as, as I said, but not the opposite once you control for demand factors, which is that more reserves do not create more deposit supply, only maybe more deposit demand, but not supply. Overall, I think it's a very great paper. It makes three main contributions. First, it provides a very elegant model um, including all the key elements of a rate steering operational framework, both supply and demand, that allow to speak about uh, um, liquidity as always well author do, but also can speak into other uh, questions that I, I will discuss in a minute. Second, it is highly policy relevant, of course, in the current context, and it runs two nice policy exercises, as I mentioned. You can either take uh, one of the two um, policy instruments as given, and it gives you a mapping for the other um, Policy, um, policy tool. And finally, it contributes to debate on the link between reserves and deposits. More deposits increase reserve demand from banks, but more reserves supply do not increase deposit supply in the author's view. So I have a few points to, to discuss. The first one would be, if you want to bring this model uh, to the euro area case, um, it would be, of course, uh, very interesting to do, but I would be cautious to uh, keep in mind a few factors. The authors, um, and da David said at the end of his presentation that his estimates on the possibility of quantitative taking might be conservative, so that you could go a bit further, but in the Euro context, there are some elements that would warrant more cautiousness. First, we do not have a non-bank uh, facility, which means that there is not this uh, uh, flat left-hand side um, uh, line of the supply side, which you could reduce without affecting the fed effective fund fund rate or the target policy rate. So we should be cautious on that. And second, we already we have another form of reserves in, uh, in the euro area, but, which are the teltros, the long-term loans from central bank to, um, to the banking system that are already being repaid. So we are already removing some reserves from the system. And as you can see on the, on the right-hand side chart, we're in the middle of it. We repaid, the banks already repaid about three quarters of the Teltros, but there's still one remaining quarter to repay until the end of 2024. So there's already some form of uh, reserve reduction to, um, uh, that is in place. So nice theoretical framework to be empirically adjusted for each jurisdiction that you want to apply it on. Second, as I said, this paper is already nice and the authors focused on uh, liquidity provision, on liquidity demand, but I think it can also inform on other aspects on the central bank balance sheet and regulation. In particular, the role of um, central bank debt securities portfolio and on, on long-term uh, financing operation at the, at the, uh, at the end, no, on the long-term framework, not only the QT, but what's the final level that you may want, depending on what's the shape of uh, the rate steering framework that you, you would be interested in. Second, it can also speak to the convenience yield of reserves. What's the impact of this convenience yield on um, the um, control of short-term rates? In particular, now that we talk about potential CBDCs that would reabsorb reserves, no, because they would be moved out of the banking system into the CBDC, and uh, yeah, how this would impact potentially uh, money market rates. So that's something that is discussed, for instance, by a paper by Abad, Nunez, and Thomas. And all second, the impact of autonomous factor shocks. So you, you quickly touched uh, uh, on that at the end of the presentation, but there could be other type of shocks. Maybe it has increased over time. Maybe this varies also depending on the jurisdictions. For instance, in Europe, uh, depending on governments, it's not always the same type of shocks that, you, that uh, the banking system can um, experiment. So this would, be this would also be useful to use your model to inform how those shocks may um, affect um, the money market rates and uh, the steering of uh, the policy uh, target rate. Finally, also the balance sheet cost, uh, which is this fee parameter in your model, and um, that should be affected by the regulation, particularly, for instance, the leverage ratio, how this could affect, um, how this regulation could affect this cost. And this, on, on this, I find very interesting that you find a very tight fit of the reserve demand equation, uh, 
uh, which suggests stable coefficients. Now, you, you have the very sta uh, uh, stable fit over 13 years, which suggests that the parameters did not change much, or they offset each other, which would be a bit surprising, while the environment had changed a lot. No? The convenience yield should have changed because of liquidity requirements on higher relative autonomous factors, so you have expect that um, banks value more in any additional unit of uh, reserves at a given level of initial reserves and initial deposits. And second, the balance sheet cost, I would have expected it also to increase given, of the, given the new leverage ratio requirements. So I don't know if you have already thought about it, how to rationalize the result and what it means for the regulation. Next, how to explain the absence of impact of uh, reserves on deposit supplies? That's something that is an important result of your, um, of your model, of your paper. It's not maybe the core of your paper, but it's an important result. And I wonder how we can think about it, because when, the, as uh, Viral uh, mentioned in his own presentation, when the central bank pushes more liquidity into the banking system, uh, by, and it's, sorry, in, uh, into the system, by buying the securities, it, cre it creates liquidity, it creates deposits. No. How, so how is it reabsorbed by, uh, the, by, the, by, the, by the central bank? Is it that uh, non-banks immediately de deposit it at uh, the central bank through the overnight uh, reverse repo facility? Or is it that then it is uh, somehow transferred to households and firms that turn then this deposit into less liquid financial assets? Second, I, could, I would expect deposits to create more uh, credit, no? when banks have more, uh, uh, sorry, reserve to create more uh, lending that creates more deposits. So when banks have more reserves, they maybe feel more comfortable into uh, lending more that mechanically creates more deposits for those that borrow. So is it that those reserves do not create credit or is it that this credit exists, but then it, it is not transferred into, uh, finally into more deposits, maybe again because of the same factors that this, uh, those deposits are really um, are changed, converted into uh, other forms of financial assets. And to deal to, with this question, is there a role for different sources of reserves, borrowed versus non-borrowed, for instance, as uh, also Lorenzo mentioned in his discussion uh, of Vion's paper. It is something that is uh, discussed in the paper at the ECB by Alta Villar, Ostelio, and Schumacher. And third point that may um, touch in, uh, to this issue, you, you say in your paper that QE may have an important driver of household financial assets in the post great financial period, but that puts in face on deposit demand, not deposit supply. So that pu putting more reserve to the system would increase deposit demand, so more deposit, but it wouldn't work through supply. And I wonder if you have uh, yeah, thought about what implications this would have, that it works through uh, demand and not supply, and if there is a way for you to test it empirically, because this would be a nice uh, addition. Finally, uh, as I said, it's already a very nice paper that already um, includes many uh, nice features. But I think uh, one possible refinement could be about uh, the link between the spread between the effective fund fund rate and the IOR and the volatility of the effective fund fund rate. Because that's what the key constraint of your second policy exercise. No, you want to avoid this uh, effective fund fund rate to be too volatile. And the way to do it is to say, OK, uh, to do it, you have to keep this spread uh, low or to constrain it. And I, so this is true that there is this link, for instance, in the euro area, it's very clear. I wonder if you could add it maybe to the paper um, empirically to show that it holds. And second, maybe to include it in the model, to find a way to include it to really close the model. Or maybe a way to do it would be to consider the implication for cross-sectional heterogeneity in deposit volumes. Not all banks have the same ratio of deposit to total assets, which may lead to, di to different heterogeneous reserve demand elasticities in your model, this VR um, prime reserve deposit function might be different across banks, and this may lead to different volatility, um, vol to different demands that may lead to volatility, in particular in the context of QT, because we'd exit this flat part of the demand line, as you said, and move to the, maybe the more vertical part, and then this heterogeneity would be even more important. But it's already, as I said, a very nice paper and very useful for policymakers in the context of energy tightening. So thank you very much. David, you want? Yeah, so just briefly, so thank you. Thank you very much. Those are really, uh, really nice, uh, nice uh, comments. Uh, some of them are actually part of our ongoing work. So we're trying to look at this, uh, not just from a time series perspective, but using some cross-sectional data too. That's taking a little longer than we thought. We also start, started thinking about applying these to other countries. 
uh, and of course to the to at least to think about the uh, uh, the ECB as well. Uh, but we're not we're not totally familiar with uh, what's the best way to do that. Uh, you, there there are a couple of things that are, I want to just uh, uh, put some thoughts in here. So one is uh, the extent to which, in our specification, these changes in regulation get not get, no, not reflected because the fit is so is so nice. This is something that surprises us too, and we start thinking about well, can we use these kind of also changes in regulation in the uh, 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 supplemental liquidity ratio, capital requirement, and so on and so forth, <laughs> as potentially a way of capturing some of the parameters of the model, the balance sheet costs, and so on, and use these as potentially interesting instruments too. So we're in the process of doing that as well. It, it doesn't seem that you know matter. Much, uh, but it's it's a it's a it's a good uh, it's a good suggestion. The the other uh, before going into the supply and demand on the deposit, which I think is 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 also part of what we what we're thinking because we're we're pretty much motivating as I as I was telling Viral yesterday. I mean the the work that that, that Rago Viral doing it's is 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 also you know uh, pretty fundamental to understand. Uh, all these correlations in the data. But before getting there, uh, w one aspect of our estimation that is important we're trying to understand in the context of, uh, of, uh, of, of publishing the, the paper is that the properties of the demand, uh, uh, the convenience yield demand is interesting because it's, it's technically deviating a little bit from being homogeneous of degree one. So the elasticity of uh, deposits uh, and, and reserve is not, not just one. Is a slightly above one, so we, we're now using this, you know, uh, uh, cross-sectional variation to see if there is something that has to do with the way, you know, this is aggregated that make us, in the aggregate, finding this larger than one effect that is connected to uh, uh, some of the uh, aspects that uh, uh, are related with. Uh, is it really uh, uh, what we see in deposit demand or supply driven and the extent to which the supply aspect of these are related with actions coming from you know, QE and QT in sequence? I think that we need to do a little bit more work on that. I think that we, this is a fundamental question for, for us as part of the discussion before. Uh, I don't think that we have a good way of thinking about uh, the real side of the economy and the extent to which the real side of the economy is also being behind what we see with the aggregate uh, deposit and reserve. In particular, uh, the example that, that we've seen uh, 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 during and after COVID is that there's some element of insurance and some element associated with the demand of this kind of uh, uh, insurance by the private sector that is behind some of these uh, you know, uh, uh, liquid asset and deposits, uh, 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 convenience value attached to them by the private sector that probably are behind some of the uh, correlation that we're picking right now with aggregate data. So uh, combining that real side of the economy and these aspects with the effort that we're trying to make in thinking about the operational framework and the demand component is, is definitely something that we all of us will be pretty much involved over the next few years in thinking hard. So those are really hard questions, good ones. And I don't have the answers. I, I, this is where we are right now. Uh, so uh, again, thanks very much. Any questions? Yeah, Philippine. Just coming to the uh, a puzzle of these um, more reserve supply would not increase uh, so much the deposit supply. Uh, have you looked at the open economy aspect for the US um, with the uh, Chinese demand for treasury bonds having a tre a tre a US treasuries have really declined? And so maybe you have some leakage in that, in that way. You, you want me to yeah, respond maybe, one by one? Maybe, we, you, yeah. maybe we can collect a few. Further questions? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe you go ahead. Uh, we, we have a look at that. We, we have <laughs> <laughs> that was This is a good question, but we, we haven't looked at it in detail. 
Carlo. No, thanks. This is a great paper. Just a, a clarification. If you can uh, probably spend uh, one, like 30 seconds on uh, explaining us what are the determinants of the, the large uh, balance sheet with respect to the rate controllability. So what is that makes really, so the size of the balance sheet uh, large and so large like you have in your estimates. So what, what is well, we, 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 we do not claim that you need to have a specific size for controllability. So, so what we claim is that given the slope of the uh, uh, demand, you need to you know, tell us what exactly is your idea of controllability, what is the spread that you would like to target, and given our estimate and the spread that you like to target, that give you a potentially, you know, size that is going to make you reach that in the medium run. But it's not necessarily tying at all the uh, uh, balance sheet of a certain size with the controllability. I mean, of course, the estimates are calling for, if anything, uh, kind of the opposite because the, the demand that we're estimating is, is pretty flat. It's pretty elastic. So the kink between the really flat part when you have a super ample reserve and the slightly less is just pretty, uh, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty big. So in terms of controllability, it's also kind of a good news. There is an intriguing question coming through WebEx, which I it's close to what I, I wanted to ask you. Intriguing. Intriguing, yeah. Uh, the latest, so uh, Marion Chapman, the latest uh, New York Fed primary dealer survey shows median dealer expectations are for system reserves to fall to $2.7 trillion in about a year's time. This is well below the upper estimate of necessary reserves quoted by both recent uh, St. Louis Fed estimates and by your own estimates of a safe upper limit. Does this suggest primary dealers intuit a, a, low, a lower limit to reserves than your own studies? If so, why might this be the, the case? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. Crazy people, this uh, primary I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I don't know what the primary dealers are thinking about uh, uh, the, the joint determination of the federal funds rate the rest of the instrument and the size of the balance sheet. So I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And I, I, it's, it's also important to think about what, what's the macro outlook that these primary dealers responding are, right. are taking into consideration in thinking about a certain amount of uh, uh, reserve in, this, in the system. Mm -hmm. So I, I, don't, I do not know. Okay. There's yeah. nothing normative in what we say. This is just yeah. try to be positive. I'm right. just giving you an example of how to think about these as a way of framing uh, controllability and the size of the balance sheet from the monetary policy perspective. Uh, and there, there's some interesting aspect at, attached to financial stability as well that we don't, we don't mention. Okay, so with that we close. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it was a yeah, great, great session. Uh, I, I learned a lot. Um, but we need to now have, well, we have a, a, a coffee break uh, and we need to come back at 4.30 sharp, because uh, there is a pretty famous person giving a keynote speech uh, from Chicago. So I think uh, we need to, to, be, uh, to be timely. Thanks a lot. <laughs>